We're going to look at expected values in two-way tables when you assume that variables are independent. Let's go back to the original question that we looked at in some earlier videos. Imagine you volunteer at an animal hospital. Dogs and cats come in with multiple numbers of fur coat colors, and you want to know if there's a difference in the fur coat colors between dogs and cats. If you rephrase that a little bit, what you really are trying to figure out is does the type of animal, dog versus cat, influence the number of fur colors? Or, phrased even differently yet, are the type of animal and the number of fur colors independent or not? And now when you think of independence, you might think of things like two coin flips. One coin flip does not affect the next coin flip, so that means that they are independent of each other. They have no influence on each other. So what we want to know is does type of animal and number of colors in the fur coat affect each other? Are they linked or related in some way, or are they totally independent? The way that we're going to be able to answer this question is by working backwards doing a hypothesis test. Now, we're going to pretend or assume that it's independent. We're going to assume that the two variables we have, they absolutely are independent. And then we're going to look at our data and try to prove statistically that we're wrong. We're going to try to put this hypothesis that they are independent and then try to prove ourselves wrong. Uh, using our calculators to find a p-value. So before we get to any of that, we have to start with this expected count. We have this data here, and actual data usually does not follow the perfect rules of math anyways, but assuming that it was independent and it followed perfect rules of math, what would we expect it to be? In order to answer a question like this, I find that it's easier to answer a different question first and then come back to it. How do you find the probability of independent events, such as the probability of heads on a coin and a six on a die happening at the same time? Well, the way that you would do that is by finding each of them separately, one out of two for a coin, one out of six for a die, and you multiply them together. So the probability here, probability of getting heads on a coin would be one half. So I'll write that down, we have one half. And the probability of getting a 6 on a die would be 1 out of 6. And so you take those two numbers, those two fractions, and you would multiply them together, and you would get 1 out of 12 is the probability that that would happen. Now, if we go back to our original question, we have our actual data that we got. And let's answer this question. What's the probability of having dogs and of having one color. We said earlier that it has to be dogs, it has to be one color, and the probability of both is where they intersect. So the 75, and it would be out of our big total, 232. So 75 out of 232. But when we have independent events, we said that we can multiply the two separate probabilities together. So if we have two independent events, then we can say the probability of dogs and one color is just the probability of dogs times the probability of one color. Now the probability of dogs, we have 120 out of 232. The probability of one color, well there's 128 animals of one color out of 232. And if you take those and multiply them together in your calculator, it'll automatically reduce your fraction to something like this, 240 over 841. But that doesn't help me fill in this table. This fills in the probability, but what I want to know is how many would you expect to get if these were independent? And I'm going to work in a little bit weird way here, so try to follow along with this. This is the probability up here, but the number is 75. So the way to turn this probability into 75 is by multiplying it by the total in the corner, the total number of things. So if you take that probability times that 232, then you would end up with that 75. In the same way, you're going to take this probability here, this fraction, and multiply it by 232, and you're going to get roughly 66.2 as the value that we would expect to get if they were independent. That's a little bit confusing. Let's go back to our coin flip situation back here. Let's imagine that we were playing this game. 
let's imagine we played it 24 times. 24 times we play this game. How many times do you expect to win? Well, if you play it 24 times and you have a 1 in 12 chance of winning, you would expect to win 24 times 1 12 equals 2 times. You expect to win 2 times. What if you played 30 times? If you played 30 times, you take 30 times 1 over 12, and if you did that in your calculator or knew that fraction in your head, you would get 2.5. Now when it comes to expected wins or expected values, it's totally fine to have decimals or fractions as your answers. It doesn't always need to be a whole number. So 2.5 as an expected value is perfectly okay. Same idea here. We took our probability times the total number of animals we had to work with, this 232, and we ended up getting 66.2. Now, if you're looking at these numbers and you see that there are some mental shortcuts, there absolutely are. One of such mental shortcuts uh, is to take this numerator here, 120, which corresponds to that number, and take this 128, which is the total down here, and uh, divide by the big total, 232, right here what you'll find is that you don't actually need to do that twice because this time multiplying down here cancels out with one of these two and so you really only have to multiply this times this divided by that and you get your answer of 66.2 the reason I don't care that you understand that or not uh, as a mental shortcut is because your calculator can do the arithmetic anyways the important part is that you understand why this expected value would be there and the reason that this is there is because you can take a probability, this and this, by multiplying the two separate probabilities. So again, if you do it separately, you break it down, and then you eventually get back to this total up here, that's the reason we can find such a value. Again, this might be a little bit confusing, so I apologize for that. Now, if we were to do this for all of them, uh, I did it in my calculator because I didn't want to do that for every one, uh, which I'll show you how to do in a moment. But if you were to do that for all of them, you would get something that looks like this. And looking at this table and this table, they clearly are not the same. So if it's supposed to be what's down here and it's not, you would say, no, it's not independent because it doesn't follow the rules of what it's supposed to be. Not independent. But if that's your immediate conclusion as it was for me, then think about this situation. If we flip a coin 100 times and only get 42 heads, does that mean that each outcome is not independent? Because we expect 50 heads when we flip a coin 100 times, but if we get something different, does that mean that they're not independent? Not necessarily. Usually, I mean, any time you're flipping a coin, there's going to be randomness involved, so sometimes it's going to be a little high, sometimes a little low, and 42 seems a little bit low, but that's very possible. It definitely could happen. The question is, is how likely is this uh, set of results up here, given that we expect something like this if it's independent? That's where a p-value comes in handy. It's we want to measure how different they really are. So expected value is all about getting this comparison chart, this uh, set of expected values in our table. The next thing we're going to do is do a statistical test, the chi-squared test, to figure out how different it really is.